Um, well, hello, Janelia. Welcome to my kitchen and also to the uh, seminar series, The Science of COVID-19. Uh, we are running this every Thursday at 2 p.m. We're bringing in outside experts to cover the science of the virus that's upending our society. Um, we'll have virologists, experts on human genetics, people looking into drugs and vaccines, et cetera. We hope to keep this uh, running um, as long as possible. Today, we are very excited to start off with Dr. Britt Gonsinger from uh, the University of California at Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute. She's also a Howard Hughes uh, investigator and she is going to tell us almost all we need to know about this virus. So take, take it over, Britt. Thank you, Lauren, and hello everyone out there at Genelia or, or wherever else you're watching from. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy today to, to be telling you about what I think is um, uh, both a daunting virus and a really fascinating virus. And so the focus of this lecture is gonna be about the molecular virology of coronavirus infection. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a general background. We know, of course, that there are seven human coronaviruses, and these are present in two of the four known genera of the coronaviridae family, the alpha coronaviruses and the beta coronaviruses. And four of these seven viruses are actually widely circulating in the human population and have been in the human population for uh, a long time. And these are NL63, 229E, OC43, and HKU1. And collectively, these four circulating coronavirus strains cause probably 10 to 30 percent of the common cold. So they cause a relatively mild upper respiratory tract infection. Of course, we know that there are three additional coronaviruses that have entered the human population much more recently, uh, all three within the last 20 years, through what are called zoonotic transmission or spillover events from other animals. And these are SARS, MERS, and of course the current COVID-2 uh, pandemic strain. For SARS, MERS, and COVID-2, all three of these zoonotic strains, uh, the assumption is that they came from bats and were transferred to humans through one or more intermediate hosts. And for SARS, we know that the host, the, the intermediate hosts were primarily civet cats. Uh, and for MERS, the intermediate hosts is likely um, dromedary camels. And so what happens is that in these hosts, the virus likely underwent a series of uh, replication, rounds of replication. This allowed the virus to gradually acquire mutations that then enabled it to more easily transmit to humans uh, and spread um, between humans in the population. We assume the same is true for COVID-2, although it is not yet clear what the intermediate host or hosts are for that. It's also possible that there was a direct transmission event that happened uh, from bats to humans. Bats are, of course, reservoirs for many zoonotic, serious uh, human viral diseases. Uh, with that said, it's uh, important to note that these seven that I told you about are, of course, not the only coronaviruses that we know of in bats. In fact, more than 500 coronaviruses have been identified in bats in China, and estimates about the total coronavirus diversity in bats reach well into the thousands. So these are probably massively undersampled in bats. Uh, and also what that means is that, uh, unfortunately, the three spillover events that we've had in the last 20 years are unlikely to be the last we will see spillover wise of these viruses into the human population because there is a massive diversity of these viruses that already exist uh, in bats. And so um, I think that really underscores how important it is to understand not only COVID-2, uh, but this family more generally speaking, and it's um, uh, the propensity that it may have for re-entering the human population at future times as well. So it's worth comparing the most recent spillover of COVID-2 to the two other zoonotic coronaviruses, SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus, both of which are actually more highly pathogenic 
than COVID-2, COVID-19, but had a more limited transmission within the human population. And so SARS was the original spillover that happened uh, late 2002, uh, largely was contained within about a year, so by the end of 2003. Uh, that outbreak led to 8,098 cases with 774 total deaths, and that epidemic has ended. So the, the last known SARS cases uh, was a small laboratory-based outbreak in 2004, and there have been no additional SARS coronavirus cases since then. So that epidemic was brought well under control within a year. MERS coronavirus, which is actually the most lethal of the zoonotic uh, coronaviruses, um, that uh, is something that is still uh, having emerging cases, basically. So fewer number of total cases, 2,521 to date with 866 total deaths. So its mortality rate is about 34%, very high. Um, but we still have periodic MERS transmission events occurring. And this is not because MERS is um, likely circulating in the human population. We think that's not the case. This is not a virus that transmits very easily person to person. Instead, the MERS spillover events are just those. They're continued spillover events from dromedary camels into humans who interact with those camels. And and this is occurring, of course, um, because uh, unlike things like civet cats, dromedary camels are very um, uh, valuable animals in many areas of the world, particularly the Arabian Peninsula. And so one cannot just cull camels in order to stop uh, that chain of transmission. And for that reason, we still have periodic MERS cases that arise. So why is it though, thinking back to SARS coronavirus, why could we bring that epidemic to an end after one year? And we are far, far from that being the case for the COVID-2 epidemic. And there are a number of likely possibilities for this. I just wanna highlight three. Um, the first is that, as I mentioned, we know the spillover, the primary spillover intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2. These were civet cats, um, and so these were basically culled in order to break that chain of transmission. We don't know the spillover reservoir for CoV-2. Um, that said, we don't, of course, think that most of the transmission is because of continued spillover anyway. We know this widely circulates human to human now. So that's less of a major reason. The second, um, which is, is an important reason, is that for SARS-CoV-1, most of the transmission occurred in hospital settings, which were actually hubs of transmission. Um, and so once this was recognized, medical personnel were able to implement barrier nursing to control transmission in the medical setting. And for COVID-2, while of course medical personnel are at an elevated risk, there's widespread community transmission. And so implementing barrier transmission, uh, barrier nursing will not stop that transmission. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, for SARS-CoV-1, there was no transmission from person to person until 24 to 36 hours after the onset of symptoms. And as far as we could tell, there were no asymptomatic cases either. And this is really important from a contact tracing perspective because it means that without asymptomatic cases um, and uh, transmission occurring only after the onset of symptoms, that things like contact tracing and isolation through classic public health measures can be really effectively implemented to uh, break the chain of transmission as well. I and mean, of course, for COVID-2, we know that there are probably abundant asymptomatic, certainly abundant mild cases, um, and transmission can occur prior to the onset of symptoms, made, which makes these other types of public health control measures of contact tracing much harder. All right, so we're hearing a lot and you will continue, I think, through this uh, wonderful seminar series to hear a lot about uh, a variety of therapeutic and vaccine approaches to combat COVID-2 and COVID-19. And I think to contextualize how and why these approaches might work, it's really important to understand 
the molecular biology of the life cycle of this virus. And so that's what I'm going to focus my talk on today. And I've broken it up into four different sections. I'm going to begin by talking about how the virus is able to enter into host cells and get its genome into the host cell. Then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about some really sophisticated um, ways and uh, very intricate ways that this virus uses to replicate and express its viral genes once it's gotten into the host cell. And then I'm going to talk about some very dramatic cell biological changes that happen to that infected cell as the virus basically reorganizes the interior of the cell to create mini replication factories to produce more viral uh, genes and RNA. And then I'm going to end by talking about some of the immune interactions that happen uh, in these infected cells, um, which I think is really important because immune interactions and responses likely underlie a lot of the severe COVID-19 disease. All right, so starting with entry uh, and just the basic uh, structure of the coronavirus particle, it's a, a pleomorphic particle. We can tell this um, from uh, cryoelectron tomography work. Um, and pleomorphic just means it doesn't have a particularly defined structure. Uh, it's about 125 nanometers in diameter. Uh, and you can see in the center of this cartoon uh, drawn viral particle is what we would call the, um, the ribonucleoprotein complex. This is the viral genome, which is an enormous RNA. It's 30 kilobases, which I'm going to spend some time talking about later because this is a very, uh, I think, fascinating and unusual feature uh, unique to coronaviruses. Uh, its genome is a plus sense, positive sense RNA. And when I say that, of course, I mean the, the, the RNA that is ribosome ready. It's a messenger RNA sense. And it is coated with a protein called uh, the nucleoprotein, which is important for both protecting the, the RNA and for helping it get unpackaged. So this uh, helical nucleocapsid uh, actually um, is kind of exceptional amongst positive stranded RNA viruses. Most positive strand RNA viruses don't have these helical nucleocapsids and pleomorphic particles. Most of them are housed in uh, icosahedral protein uh, sort of um, uh, structures. And so this is pretty unusual and makes coronavirus a little bit more like negative sense RNA viruses, which tend to be more pleomorphic. Um, and helical shaped like this one is. So this nucleocapsid is surrounded by a lipid envelope, so it's a black circle surrounding that helical core, and um, many viruses will have lipid envelopes that they are using to protect their viral genome or their viral particle. In all cases, that lipid envelope is stolen from the host. So no virus has the capacity to generate its own lipids, um, and uh, lipids are always stolen from the host and frequently done so by viruses. And this lipid envelope is studded by a number of viral proteins, the most notable of which, of course, is the large trimeric spike protein shown in light blue. This is the protein that gives these viral particles their name, corona, for, for um, uh, either uh, the halo effect that's seen during a, a solar eclipse or the crown-like shape that one sees when you look at these uh, uh, viruses under an electron micrograph. Um, the spike protein I'm going to talk a little bit more about because, of course, this is the, the, the protein that's really critical for viral entry and is the source of, of course, a lot of vaccine development and, and other sorts of um, uh, interventions right now. In addition to the spike protein, the, actually the most abundant protein on these viral particles is uh, a transmembrane glyco, uh, transmembrane protein called the matrix protein. That's shown in red here. You can see that the tails of that matrix protein, the squiggly black lines, are actually coming in contact with the viral nucleoprotein complex. And that's because um, part of the role of the matrix is, is to link that uh, viral genome complex to the envelope uh, during the, the viron morphogenesis or sort of um, formation stage at the, as these particles are being formed. And then finally, there's a more minor envelope protein called E, which is also probably important during virion formation. 
So let's take a closer look at the spike protein. Um, as you, many of you are probably aware, um, this is a protein which we now have significant structural information for CoV-2 due to some uh, very impressive early work on this. And, uh, and I'm pulling up one of the, the structures. This is a cryo-EM structure uh, from one of the papers that's cited below. And um, the, on this structure, um, what, what there is, is there's sequence conservation from a number of related beta coronaviruses that are basically plotted onto the CoV-2 spike protein. Um, and, and that's to, to show the level of conservation. And so you can see that more variable regions of the protein are shown in teal color, and the more conserved regions of the protein are shown in, in darker purple. And so just a quick glance at the, at the spike um, trimer, and you can see that you can pretty much break this protein almost into two domains, this upper globular domain, which is clearly more variable, and a lower sort of stalk-like domain, which is much more conserved. And so uh, the variable domain is the region of the protein that engages with the receptor. It's the receptor binding domain. And not at all surprising then that this would be a more variable region of the protein. This is true for pretty much all uh, viral um, uh, receptor interacting domains. They are under intense evolutionary pressure because of interactions with the immune system that cause these to generally be among the most variable regions of the viral genome. Uh, in contrast, the lower part of the spike protein, uh, the, the more invariant component, encodes the fusion machinery. And in fact, in the center is this hydrophobic fusion peptide, which is um, the, what is really critical for uh, helping the virus to get past the plasma membrane. And so this region of the protein is more protected generally from antibodies. And because it orchestrates a really complicated series of uh, structural transitions to allow for fusion, it is much less tolerant uh, they tend to be much less tolerant to um, uh, variation. All right, so how, how does entry happen? Well, of course, for CoV-2, uh, entry is driven between by interactions with that spike trimer and a host protein called angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. Uh, you can think of this interaction as like a lock and key mechanism, where the spike protein uh, is like the master key that when it inserts into the lock, which is the ACE2 receptor, this triggers a series of changes that allows the virus in. It allows it past the plasma membrane. And so the virus will engage with the ACE2 receptor. That's not sufficient though. Um, in order for the virus to get into the cell, uh, it needs to have a second event, which is a series of cleavages that, that happen um, through uh, cellular proteases. And, and the main protease involved in cleavage of the uh, coronavirus 2 spike protein uh, is this protease called TMPRSS2. And so it induces two cleavage events. Um, the first cleavage event is one that um, removes basically the receptor binding domain uh, from the fusogenic domain. And the second event is the one that activates the fusogenic state of the protein to allow subsequent entry of the virus uh, either at the plasma membrane or during receptor-mediated endocytosis. The actual site of entry uh, for coronaviruses and CoV-2 in particular is not yet clear. And it may be that it could use both mechanisms. So the spike protein is a classic type one fusion protein. There are three types of viral fusion proteins. Other type one fusion proteins uh, that are very well characterized are, for example, the HA protein for uh, influenza virus, the HIV uses the type 1 fusion protein, Ebola virus uses a type 1 fusion protein, and all of these type 1 fusion proteins undergo a pretty similar series of conformational changes that allow the virus to enter the cell, and, and those general changes are diagrammed here at, at the bottom of, of my slide. So prior to triggering, uh, the, the receptor binding subunit is actually clamped 
onto that fusion subunit, right? Like, like we, we saw in the, in the cryo-EM structure. And protease cleavage, and so this is, you can think of this as basically it's holding the fusion protein in almost a metastable state. Um, and that, that, that protease cleavage event, which removes that clamp, then is allowing a cascade of conformational changes to occur um, uh, for this protein. And so that protease cleavage causes the receptor binding subunit to basically move out of the way, unclamping the fusion subunit, um, which can then then form a um, pre-hairpin structure that gets embedded into the plasma membrane using that hydrophobic uh, fusion peptide that's tucked um, normally on the inside of the fusion machinery. So it opens up, inserts into the plasma membrane, um, and then that pre-hairpin starts to fold back uh, and form a, a six helix bundle. Um, and that progressively basically pulls the two membranes together, the viral membrane that is encasing the viral genome and the host plasma membrane, um, ultimately promoting fusion. And so then this viral, the final post-fusion state um, is a, always a trimer of hairpins. So what this is doing is it is allowing the virus to deposit its genome, which is the payload for the virus, into the cytoplasm. I just want to spend a moment um, uh, talking about uh, a couple of interesting differences between um, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the coronavirus-1 spike protein. And so um, uh, there's a, a couple of notable differences that I'll just draw your attention to. First is that the receptor binding domain, we know for CoV-1 there are um, uh, five, uh, there are six different amino acids that are important for engagement with that ACE2 receptor. For CoV-2, five of those six are different than they are for SARS coronavirus-1. And so, um, but yet it binds the ACE2 receptor uh, with a similar um, uh, affinity as the coronavirus-1 spike protein does. So it's found another, albeit equally efficient way to engage the receptor. The second th point that I wanna make is that unique to CoV-2, the spike protein has acquired what's called a polybasic cleavage site. And this has gotten a lot of sort of press because polybasic cleavage sites are things that are predicted to enable cleavage by other cellular proteases, furin, for example, or maybe more efficient cleavage by um, the TMPRSS2 um, protease. And that's important because we know from work with other pathogenic viruses, in particular for influenza virus, that uh, viral fusion proteins that acquire this polybasic cleavage site um, tend to uh, have increased uh, transmissibility uh, from person to person. So there's a lot of speculation about whether the widespread transmission of this virus compared to the other zoonotic coronaviruses could at least in part be linked to acquisition of this polybasic cleavage site. All right. So the virus has now deposited its RNA into the cytoplasm of cells. And it's got to now basically try and get the viral genes expressed from that RNA in order to orchestrate replication and amplification of that RNA to make many more progeny virions. And so how does it do that? Well, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, the genome for coronaviruses is a single strand of a very long RNA, 30 kilobase RNA that is a plus sense RNA. And the, uh, the CoV-2 uh, genome has been annotated um, to possess, depending on the annotation that you look at, about 14 different open reading frames that encode 27 or so different proteins that are required for getting this virus replicated, basically, and new progeny virions to, to form. So let's think about that for a minute, because um, for any um, uh, uh, virus, to, once it's in a cell, it, it really has to conform, of course, to the rules of gene expression that are set by the host cell that it's infecting. Um, and so um, 
uh, for uh, eukaryotes, that is generally, that there is one protein per expressed per messenger RNA. The vast majority of our messenger RNAs are monosystronic, so one gene per messenger RNA, different from pro prokaryotes, of course, which are polysystronic, so multiple um, open reading frames can be translated from the same RNA. So you have a virus that puts in one RNA, but somehow needs to express 20 to 30 proteins from that RNA. How does that, how does it do that without breaking kind of the eukaryotic rules of, of translation? Well, um, for coronaviruses, we know that it uses at least three different tricks in order to get its genes expressed. Um, and I'm going to talk about those three uh, strategies that the virus uses in, in the coming slides. But, but first, let's just take a look at sort of the, the overall structure of uh, the coding information on the viral genome. Um, You'll note that uh, in brown here on this diagram of the viral genome uh, is basically one what is really giant open reading frame that encodes all of the non-structural proteins. So for viruses, non-structural proteins are usually things like enzymes that are doing the work of viral replication. And then at the three prime portion of the genome are the remaining open reading frames that encode all of the structural genes, the things that go um, like the spike protein and the matrix protein and the nucleocapsid protein, as, as well as a number of accessory factors that I'll talk a little bit about too. So the first thing that has to happen for this virus and for any positive sense RNA virus is that you've got to be able to express the machinery needed to, um, to generate messenger RNAs that can be read by the ribosome. Uh, no virus encodes its own translation machinery, um, but all RNA viruses have to encode their own transcription machinery. Every RNA virus makes its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase um, because that machinery doesn't exist in the cell for it to steal. And that is not, uh, there's no exception here for coronaviruses within its non, large non-structural um, protein open reading frame encodes basically the, the replicase machinery. And because the incoming genome itself is positive sense RNA and can be read directly by the ribosomes, that means that this virus doesn't have to package its polymerase or its replicase machinery into the viral particle it can just encode them on the genome and have them be translated first thing once that viral RNA is deposited into the cytoplasm. And that's what happens for um, coronaviruses. So how does it get 27 proteins made from a single incoming RNA? Uh, so it's just to say that, yeah, the RDRP is translated directly from the genomic RNA. Well, the first strategy that it uses, which actually a number of, of positive sense RNA viruses uh, use, is that it translates that first giant open reading frame uh, it, as a, it's basically one um, what we call polyprotein. So all of the proteins that make up the replication machinery are expressed as a giant fusion protein where one protein is fused to the next protein, fused to the next protein. So each of the open reading frames here um, or each of the genes are not separated by distinct start and stop codons. There's one start codon at the beginning and a stop codon at the end. And so you just have a fusion of all of the proteins. This, is, this polyprotein then is cleaved by a virally encoded protease. There are actually two proteases uh, in coronaviruses that can cleave both in cis and in trans this polyprotein into the individual protein unit. So now you're not breaking the eukaryotic rules of translation. You are translating one protein from that RNA. It's just that protein then can then be processed into tens of other proteins through proteolytic processing. All right. Um, the, uh, in the red box, what I'm showing you here is that, in fact, there is a stop codon, except kind of right midway through that giant polyprotein. So that um, a lot of the time, only half of the polyprotein is going to get made, the first half, which actually lacks the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So you'd need to somehow find a way to read through that stop codon in order to express the rest of the replicase machinery. 
And so reading through that uh, stop codon would allow you to make the rest of that giant open reading frame. And for coronaviruses, this is done through a translational frame shifting event. Uh, and that translational frame shifting event um, occurs uh, through um, two mechanisms. And so it turns out that the sequence right around that stop codon has what's called a slippery sequence. This is a heptanucleotide sequence, UUU, AAAC. When the ribosome hits that sequence, it has a propensity to slip back one nucleotide, which would put it out of frame with the stop codon uh, and allow it to continue then reading through to the end of that uh, open reading frame. Now, the chance that that uh, frame shifting event might occur, you might think would be pretty low, and, and most of the time that would probably be the case, except for the fact that just downstream of this slippery sequence, the virus has an RNA structure called a pseudonaut structure. And a pseudonaut is basically an extremely stable RNA structure um, that when the ribosome comes and hits that structure, it causes it to pause a little bit. And it's pausing right over the slippery sequence, which is then increasing the chance that it's gonna slip back. And in fact, for these coronaviruses is estimated that the translational um, frame shifting event happens pretty frequently, maybe 30 to 50% of the time uh, and before the ribosome then continues to read through. So this is a strategy that actually allows the virus to fine tune the protein levels that it needs. It needs less of the polymerase than it might need of other things like the proteases and things that are in the, the five prime portion of the open reading frame. And so by using this translational frame shifting, it can control to some extent the overall abundance of uh, or stoichiometry of the proteins that it will need to replicate its genome. All right, so that's how all of the genes that are at the five prime end of the genome are made through a giant polyprotein. That doesn't solve the problem for any of the genes at the three prime end of the genome, which are the structural and the accessory uh, genes uh, that encode those, those proteins. And so how this happens is actually something that is quite unique to coronaviruses uh, and a very unusual gene expression strategy that involves something called discontinuous transcription. So if you'll notice uh, uh, these, um, these, these uh, RNAs that I'm diagramming below the genome structure in gray here, there's a series of them. These are called subgenomic RNAs, which just basically means they are shorter than genome length, subgenome length RNAs that are made that will uh, serve as the messenger RNAs to produce each of those three prime end um, transcripts. And so you'll notice that they're all coterminal. Um, and uh, a feature of these is that each one that's made allows one of those genes to be present at the five prime end of the RNA. So let me just diagram an example here. Uh, in the upper, uh, the top one, gene two, which would represent the spike protein, for example, the spike gene. Um, it, in this particular RNA, is present at the five prime end, so the ribosome will come along, it will translate gene two into protein two, into the spike protein. All of the open reading frames downstream of that, genes three, four, and five, are basically invisible to the ribosome. These are untranslated sequence because in eukaryotes, right, the ribosome translates the first um, open reading frame it comes to. It does not scan down and continue to reinitiate at downstream open reading frames. So um, uh, same thing, to produce the next gene down, you have another subgenomic RNA that allows gene three to be present at the five prime end, uh, and all subsequent genes are untranslated um, sequence, et cetera. And in this way, each of these structural or accessory uh, open reading frames has the chance to be uh, translated uh, into their protein. But the question is, is how does the virus um, make these subgenomic RNAs? And that ties into another really sort of weird feature of these, which is, yeah, the fact that they're all three prime coterminal makes a lot of sense. The, 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 the polymerase is going to start at the three prime end and, you know, and then translate, uh, transcribe through to produce the RNA. But another feature is that not only are they three prime coterminal, they all have the exact same sequence 
at their five prime end. And that sequence is the same sequence as is present at the extreme five prime end of the genomic RNA, which is called the leader sequence, which is denoted L here. And so that sequence is actually only found on the genome at the very five prime end of the RNA. So how is it that that sequence gets appended to all of these subgenomic RNAs? That's where this process of discontinuous transcription comes in. It turns out that um, at, the, at the start of each of those genes at the, at the three prime end of the genome, there is a conserved sequence called a transcriptional regulatory sequence, uh, denoted as TRS here, okay? So that's present right at the beginning of each of those genes. It is also present um, uh, just after that leader sequence at the extreme five prime end of the genome. And uh, within that transcriptional regulatory sequence, there is a, a really conserved core sequence here denoted as CS. And so as the polymerase comes along and starts transcribing in the uh, five prime to three prime direction, of course, um, then uh, it, as it reaches the um, transcriptional regulatory sequence, it either will ignore it and continue transcribing until it hits the next transcriptional regulatory sequence, or it will stop and um, move that RNA, basically jump that RNA probably through a long-range RNA-RNA interaction to then base pair with that core sequence that's present just downstream of the leader before it continues to transcribe, thereby fusing that five prime leader sequence onto each of these RNAs. So that looks something like this, where uh, the genomic RNA is shown in black and the newly transcribing RNA is shown in red. Uh, so the RNA uh, polymerase will be transcribing that new RNA as it encounters one of these TRS sequences. As I said, it'll either read through it or it will basically jump and move that RNA all the way up to the five prime end where it base pairs with that five prime leader sequence before um, finishing transcription to encode uh, the same uh, uh, sequence at the five prime end. And so these are of course these red RNAs that I'm showing you, the newly synthesized RNAs that are occurring during discontinuous transcription are, uh, are the um, complement, right? So they're negative sense RNAs. These cannot be used as messenger RNAs. The polymerase then has to go back and copy each of these subgenomic minus sense RNAs into messenger RNAs can, that can then be used to uh, produce the proteins found at the three prime end of the genome. So this is a, a really unusual um, gene expression strategy that coronavirus is using. It has some interesting consequences for this virus, one of which is that because of all of this polymerase jumping that's happening, these viruses have astronomically high rates of recombination, estimates of something like 25%. Usually recombination in these uh, RNA viruses, um, these, these plus sense RNA viruses is basically vanishingly small. So coronaviruses are unique in their extraordinarily high rates of recombination, which likely plays into the evolution of these viruses and potentially why they can maintain uh, to some extent such enormous genomes as, as I'm gonna talk about further. All right. So this relatively complicated transcriptional event requires a very sophisticated replication complex. Uh, and the replicase for coronavirus requires functional integration of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity, which is encoded by um, non-structural protein 12, capping activity uh, to produce messenger RNAs with five prime caps that are recognized by the ribosome, and proofreading activity, very interestingly. So the polymerase holoenzyme, uh, the structure of which is shown here on the left, um, is made up of three proteins, the, the actual RDRP, NSP12, as well as um, NSP7 and NSP8, which are thought to help with processivity of the polymerase. Um, 
this is actually able to thought to be able to initiate de novo RNA synthesis. So it doesn't need a primer to initiate synthesis. It just can orient itself right at the end of the viral uh, genome to initiate synthesis. And then there's this fourth component here, um, NSP14, which is fascinating. So NSP14 uh, has uh, both uh, thought to have capping activity, but it's got this exon domain, this exonuclease domain, which turns out to be important for proofreading. And the discovery of this activity was really um, paradigm shifting for thinking about how these viruses exist at all, given the, the size of their genomes, and how RNA-dependent RNA polymerases uh, function. Because until the discovery of this proofreading activity, the dogma in the field, of course, is that RNA-dependent RNA polymerases do not proofread. And this is the basis for the rapid evolution seen for RNA viruses. And that's because their polymerases, since they cannot proofread, means they incorporate um, errors at dramatically higher rates than the polymerases in our cells do. So rates of like every 10 to the fourth or, or 10 to the fifth nucleotides, which means that for an average sized RNA virus, um, it is incorporating at least one mutation per round of replication. And so this creates these um, mutant swarms that are characteristic of RNA viruses like influenza virus and HIV um, and others, uh, which are called quasi-species uh, that drives uh, the evolution of these viruses. But what that also does is it constrains the size that the genome of an RNA virus can be. Uh, and in fact, um, the theoretical size limit for an RNA genome, an RNA virus, is about 30 kilobases. Remember, coronaviruses are 30 kilobases. Most RNA viruses, they don't even come close to hitting that theoretical size limit. They're in the, you know, the, the 10 to 18 kilobase range. They stay well below that size. And that theoretical size limit comes from this um, uh, error-prone RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity. Because the longer your genome is, the more errors are going to get made every round of replication. And as your genome gets larger, that means that um, there's an increased change that you're going to hit something called error catastrophe. And this is what happens when too many errors are incorporated into the genome. The virus cannot tolerate that, and the whole population of viruses crashes as a consequence. And that's been beautifully demonstrated experimentally for many RNA viruses, um, particularly the coronaviruses and, and others like that. So, how is it? Yeah, this was a mystery for quite some time. How could, how could coronaviruses tolerate genomes that were so huge? Um, and it turns out that it's likely because unlike all of these other canonical RNA viruses, they can proofread um, uh, through their RDRP. And so interestingly, this exonuclease activity, this exon activity, is only present in viruses that have enormous genomes. So there's this whole sort of order of uh, viruses uh, that are uh, similar to coronaviruses, and many, not all, but many of those have this exon activity. And exon activity is present in no virus, no RNA virus um, whose genome size is uh, smaller than 20 kb. And so, uh, indeed, loss of exon activity dramatically increases the mutation rate of uh, SARS coronavirus and other coronaviruses that have been studied for this. So, uh, on the left here, I'm just showing um, uh, uh, a, um, the unique substitutions per genome that are observed during wild type SARS coronavirus infection compared with a SARS coronavirus where that XON activity was mutated. And you can see there's about a 20 fold increase in the mutation frequency if you get rid of this proofreading activity. Um, you can see this on a genome wide scale here, looking at the upper, um, the, the, the upper uh, plot here where uh, the wild type virus is denoted by uh, black lines. You can see the, the, the changes that are happening during the rounds of wild type virus replication. There's a few, 
Um, but the gray lines are the mutations that are happening in an exon mutant, and so they're dramatically increased across the virus. Furthermore, this sensitizes the virus to RNA mutagens, and so a um, particular mutagen used in this experiment was 5-fluorouracil, which of course increases the mutation frequency even of the proofreading um, wild-type virus, but dramatically increases the mutation frequency of uh, the exon mutant virus as well. Okay. So um, X, the XON activity uh, is present in this viral protein, NSP14, which I told you has multiple functions. So this is not uncharacteristic of viruses. The viral proteins are sort of classic for their ability to do many things uh, with just one protein. And, and this is true for this one probably too. It's a bimodular protein that's got two domains. It's got an exon domain that is responsible, uh, uh, it coordinates with another viral protein, NSP10, to operate in what's thought uh, uh, in a mismatch repair type mechanism of proofreading. Then there's this flexible hinge region and a, a second domain that has the methyltransferase activity thought to be important for messenger RNA capping activity for the virus. So it's got these two functions. Um, that are two separate domains that can probably, because of this flexible hinge, do their activity and, uh, as needed for the virus. I think it's important to note, uh, what are some of the ramifications of having a proofreading activity on an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase? Because this makes this virus different from all other RNA viruses that, uh, that uh, infect humans that we know of. First is that, or the main thing is that, uh, that means that if you have proofreading activity, you have the potential as a virus to excise um, mutagens. And so um, it's been shown that the XON can efficiently excise ribavirin, which is a really common uh, antiviral that is used um, ex experimentally basically to block the RDRP activity uh, of um, uh, many different RNA viruses. Uh, but it turns out for coronaviruses, they are not sensitive to ribavirin like all the other RNA viruses are. And that's because once this chain terminator comes in, the uh, proofreading activity just kicks it right back out. So I think that's important to consider in the context of the kind of classic strategies for generating uh, polymerase inhibitors, which is usually through some sort of a nucleoside analog. Um, so it's been suggested, um, and there's some experimental evidence indicating that XON can reduce remdesivir incorporation. So remdesivir is, a, is of course, a nucleoside analog that's being extensively explored now for uh, CoV-2 um, and is showing uh, uh, potentially some promise there. Um, but it's possible that its activity is muted to some extent because of this XON proofreading function. And so it may be worthwhile to try simultaneously targeting the RDRP and this exonuclease activity um, through a, some sort of dual combination drug. All right, so that's the replication in gene expression um, portion of the talk which is the longest portion of the talk. I'm a gene expression person myself, and so um, uh, you'll have to forgive me for focusing on that, which I think is a fascinating aspect of coronavirus biology anyway. And now we're gonna move on to some really uh, sort of striking changes that happen to the inside of a cell that is infected with coronavirus. And the formation of these compartments that are, um, that are called, uh, replication and transcription um, compartments. So um, these are uh, these are are basically um, membranes. So there's dramatic membrane reorganization that happens in the, in the context of coronavirus infection. And so um, membranes in the cytoplasm, if you, you can see from these uh, electron uh, tomographs that in a, a coronavirus infected cell, and this is uh, showing a cell that is infected with SARS coronavirus 1, the cytoplasm becomes chock full of these double membrane vesicles. Um, and you can sort of see one outlined here. And this is a, a tomograph here, uh, reconstruction showing you a group of these vesicles. And so it looks like actually the outer membrane is probably contiguous um, with the rough endoplasmic reticulum is what's thought that these are derived from. And then you have these inner vesicles that, um, that are formed. Um, and uh, 
these are actually, they're sort of reminiscent of autophagosomes, um, but, and they do appear to co-localize with things like LC3, um, but beta coronaviruses have been shown not to require at least canonical aut autophagy for their life cycle. And so exactly um, how the biogenesis of these, I think is a really active, interesting um, area of research. But why are they formed? Um, what is this doing for the virus? Well, it turns out the virus is using these as mini replication factories. So it's allowing the virus to amplify its genome and express its genes um, in a protected way, right? So not exposed to um, maybe sensors that could be present in the cytoplasm or uh, other things. So it's doing it in these protected vesicles. That also allows it to concentrate the machinery that it, that it needs, the replicase machinery into this um, concentrated area to perhaps increase the efficiency of the gene expression, the transcription and replication events. And so these sort of re membrane remodeling events, again, are seen in many different RNA virus infections. But the thing that's kind of unique about the coronavirus one is the fact that they're basically forming a, an intact vesicle on its own rather than just having uh, replication associated with membranes or partial invaginations of membranes. The fact that they're sort of forming these complete vesicles is a pretty unusual uh, a feature. All right, so these vesicles um, have been explored um, or are certainly being explored as potential antiviral targets because formation of these vesicles is really critical for the coronavirus uh, amplification inside the cell. And so um, drugs that may disrupt membrane biology or vesicle formation are, of course, uh, things that people are quite interested in for their potential antiviral function against, against these viruses. So there's been some work to try and figure out um, how are these made um, and what proteins are in them uh, using uh, things like proximity-based labeling, uh, bioID uh, type um, uh, labeling approaches to explore what is present there. And I'm not going to talk about the, the host protein side of things, but I will just spend a minute saying which of the viral proteins are associated with these um, membrane structures. And so in pink here uh, are denote the viral proteins that are significantly enriched in these replication transcription complexes, the, RT, the RTC centers. And they make a lot of sense because, in fact, um, most of these are the non-structural proteins, right? And we think of non-structural proteins as being the things that should be involved often in, um, in RNA synthesis and RNA replication, which is what's happening in these factories. And so the right things that one would expect are, in fact, there. And indeed, three of the non-structural proteins, NSP3, NSP4, and NSP6, have been shown in more minimalist systems to be sufficient to induce these, um, these double membrane vesicles and cells. So one can transfect just those proteins um, into the cell and uh, it's thought that uh, these, that the interaction between the luminal loops of these proteins drives the membrane curvature to form these particles. And so this makes them somewhat of a more tractable system to, to try and understand the biogenesis of these. All right. It's also interesting to think about what are the proteins that aren't found, the viral proteins that are not found in these replication transcription complexes. And um, one of the proteins that's not found, or at least not enriched there, is a protein called NSP1 that is a really key pathogenicity factor for coronaviruses. NSP1 is a protein that restricts host gene expression. It's uh, in virology, we call these host shutoff factors. And um, it does this through a two-pronged approach. It binds the 40S ribosome and causes the ribosome to stall, basically, to inhibit translation of host RNAs. And it also induces an endonucleolytic cleavage event on host RNAs to promote their accelerated degradation. This is mostly specific for host RNAs because that five prime leader sequence, remember that I was telling you about, that is fused to every single coronavirus messenger RNA and subgenomic RNA 
protects those RNAs against NSP1 activity, which is maybe one reason why they have that leader sequence. Um, and so this is an important pathogenicity factor for the virus because the consequence of inhibiting host gene expression is twofold. Uh, one is that viruses tend to do this because it helps them outcompete host transcripts for translation machinery. Uh, they don't want to have to compete. Uh, they want to steal as much of the translation machinery for themselves as possible, and host shutoff enables them to do that. The second reason is that if you think about genes that are turned on in response to a viral infection, that's going to be a lot of immune stimulatory genes, things that are in the type 1 interferon pathway. And so the role of proteins like NSP1 is to prevent those from getting made, and that serves to dampen the initial immune response to the virus and allow the virus to get a foothold and start replicating without immune-based restriction. And so um, that's uh, the importance of this protein is shown here. This is a, a mouse kill curve in which you can see that mice infected with a wild type virus, and in here they're using a, um, a mouse model coronavirus called MHV that also has this activity. Um, all these mice die by about six days post-infection. Um, however, if they mutate this NSP1 function of the protein now, uh, the virus replicates, okay, but none of the, um, none of the mice die, and, and that's because presumably the virus is able to more effectively control that initial replication uh, of the virus through mounting an effective innate immune response. All right, so what else is not in these replication compartments? Uh, the other things are um, a bunch of assembly proteins. That makes sense because coronavirus assembly doesn't happen in these uh, RTCs. That's where replication and transcription happens. Assembly happens elsewhere. So uh, it makes sense that those wouldn't be there. There are also a number of accessory proteins uh, present uh, in, in cells, but not in association with these complexes. And so what are accessory proteins? These are proteins in viruses that tend to be specific to a particular viral species or um, genera. Um, and they're usually dispensable for viral replication in tissue culture, uh, in vitro, but are required in an organismal infection setting, in an animal or in a person. And that, so what they're doing is they're basically fine-tuning or counteracting key host responses that are going to be present in an organism that would normally constrain viral replication. And so what I'm showing you here are the accessory proteins for different beta coronaviruses of three lineages. The accessory proteins are labeled in blue. You can just kind of glance through and see that um, the ones present in lineage A versus and lineage C are quite different from those present in lineage B. So uh, again, these proteins vary, um, unlike the non-structural proteins and the structural proteins, which are going to be quite conserved across the coronaviruses. And because these accessory factors, as I said, are normally involved in modulating the host response, it's probably not surprising that many of these have been shown to be um, manipulating the innate immune response. And that the ones that I've put with red stars here are known to sort of interface with the, uh, the interferon and innate immune response pathways, also control cell death responses and, and things like that. Okay. And then um, for assembly of nucleocapsids, I mentioned this doesn't happen in those RTCs. Instead, um, this um, morphogenesis process is occurring um, in association with the ER and the Golgi. And so what happens is that the RNAs that are made somehow have to get the genomes, have to get transferred we don't know how, from these replication double membrane vesicles um, to elsewhere in the cytoplasm where they can be complexed with the nucleoprotein, the nucleocapsid protein, because that interaction between the viral RNA and the nucleocapsid protein, which also binds leader sequence, by the way, 
um, helps uh, direct that um, viral nuclear uh, protein particle now to interact with the matrix protein, which is now studded um, in this ER Golgi intermediate component or the, the ER GIC that I'm, I'm showing here sort of um, in the center. Um, these are uh, these are mobile transport complexes that basically can deliver secretory cargo from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi. And then, um, so the, the nucleocapsid is budding into these components where um, the, the viral matrix protein and spike protein and envelope proteins have already been deposited. They've been translated and, and inserted into these membranes. And then the virus buds through them to acquire its envelope. And then it is released from the cell through an exocytosis-like mechanism. Okay. So this brings us to the final portion of um, this talk where I'm going to uh, spend some time discussing the immune interactions that occur during a coronavirus infection. And I think most notably is the fact that these highly pathogenic coronaviruses, SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus, and I'm going to show you in a minute, also probably SARS-CoV-2, induce very little, if any, interferon in most cells, which is unusual, particularly for an RNA virus. And so this um, gel that I'm showing you here um, on the left just shows uh, the induction of interferon beta, sort of classic interferon um, uh, induction gene, where you can see that there, there's no interferon beta in a mock-infected cell. The control infection where you see a strong induction. Uh, this is uh, infection with um, a bunya virus, so uh, another RNA virus, which you can see is easily recognized by the innate immune system, induces a strong interferon beta induction. SARS coronavirus, though, looks pretty similar to the mock infection. And so clearly these viruses have strategies of strongly dampening that innate immune response. And I told you about one key strategy, which was that host shutoff factor, but the, the virus encodes a number of additional putative interferon antagonists, which I've um, listed here. So I mentioned this is not just SARS coronavirus, but uh, some very recent work by Ben Tenover's group looking at the um, gene expression signature for SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are in lung A549 cells compared with infection of another RNA virus, a human influenza A virus, shows how dramatically different these viruses are in their um, host gene expression signature. And so you can see that for influenza A virus, there's lots of genes that are induced um, that fall under the category of interferon-related or interferon-stimulated um, genes. Um, in contrast, a SARS coronavirus 2 basically lacks robust induction of type 1 and type 3 interferons and a number of chemokines um, that uh, would um, be indicative of the fact that this virus is doing an excellent job dampening these early, which are critical, immune responses in, in a host. Um, so this model has emerged in the field that pathogenesis of these viruses, and this is I'm um, thinking about now um, SARS coronavirus where much of this work has been done, is linked to this delayed interferon signaling. Um, and that delayed interferon signaling allows the virus to take hold replication-wise, and then uh, the host induces a, a late immune response, but one that is less efficacious against reducing the, fire, the virus and more toxic against the host itself. So the, that, in fact, interferon is induced, but it's too late, too late and, and maybe too exuberant, and that is actually causing severe disease. And that, and that um, concept is demonstrated here. This is another mouse um, kill curve where you can compare infection of a wild type Balbsi mice mouse um, to those in which the, the interferon alpha receptor, which is important for interferon signaling, is knocked out. And um, so in the wild type mice, of course, uh, they're all dying, or the vast majority of them are dying by uh, eight to 12 days post-infection with, with the coronavirus. However, if you prevent interferon signaling, all those mice survive, which tells you that the pathology of the virus ultimately is linked to 
some sort of aberrant interferon signaling. And that's not because these mice are not replicating the virus uh, as well. You can see this is just showing the the, the number of plaque forming units, which is a way to quantify the viral infection per lung um, for these two mice. And, and at these various time points, they're basically uh, the same. Uh, so the virus is replicating just fine, but the pathology is coming from the immune response um, here. And so the model is that these high initial virus titers are due to a, a late interferon response that drives aberrant recruitment of pathogenic inflammatory monocyte macrophages, activation of the innate immune response, and cytotoxicity. And this is happening in the lung, um, which is causing what's causing the severe respiratory distress syndrome is the pathology that the immune system is causing in that lung that is basically too much too late. And then I just want to end, this is my last um, slide here, um, mentioning that you, we are, of course, hearing a lot about antibodies, uh, serum antibodies, uh, tests that are coming out, the, the, of course, the drive to generate a vaccine to generate neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that um, antibodies are sort of a, a challenge for natural infection with coronavirus. And in fact, neutralizing antibody titers and memory B cell responses are pretty short-lived for coronavirus. This is a graph here showing um, a patient cohort for SARS coronavirus um, patients, where you can see that um, for uh, most of the patients, the, the, the cohort is shown in black, that the neutralizing antibody titers, they are produced, but they're dropping off um, round about the two-year point. So they're there, but they're there only relatively transiently. Um, in green and in orange are a couple of outlier patients who were able to have sustained a neutralizing antibody responses, but for most of the cohort, neutralizing antibody is not sticking around. This is, in fact, even more dramatic with the circulating, the four circulating uh, human coronaviruses that cause uh, the common cold. They, um, uh, their neutralizing antibody is very short-lived, so less than a year, um, which is why people can continue to seasonally get reinfected probably with these viruses. Um, but I also want to mention that in thinking about um, the, the role of antibody um, uh, in, you know, the current pandemic, um, it's worth considering that there are cross-reactive antibodies against the different beta coronaviruses. And so it has certainly been shown that the, the between the two circulating coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1 that are of the beta coronavirus sub, uh, uh, genera, that there are cross-reactive antibodies uh, uh, between these two groups. They don't last very long, of course, um, but that these may protect or lessen the infection. Um, if you've got one, then you may have antibodies uh, that will protect you against the other, provided that infection is in a pretty narrow time window. It's also been shown that SARS coronavirus neutralizing antibodies function um, as for cross protection for the OC43 um, a strain of circulating coronavirus. So there is clearly cross, uh, cross recognition here, whether or not um, the, the cross uh, reactivity is uh, neutralizing antibodies is not always clear. That has been shown for the SARS case, but not necessarily clear for the others. So I think that's gonna be something to be important to, to um, uh, keep in mind of, as to how is it that antibodies from a recent infection, for example, with one of the circulating coronaviruses, um, may influence the population level susceptibility to COVID-2 infection or reinfection, or just influence if there is cross-reactivity between those antibodies, uh, how people might interpret um, uh, these serum antibody uh, 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 kits that, that are becoming available. All right. So I'm going to end there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I just want to acknowledge that I definitely got slide assistance um, from a number of individuals who also helped me provide uh, collect information for this talk. These are listed here. Laurent Koskoy, who's a, who's a colleague of mine at UC Berkeley, as well as members of my lab, Divi Ananda Kumar, Ella Hartinian, Michael Lee, Azra Lari, Jessica Tucker, and Allison Dudichuk. 
uh, institutes that um, have helped fund our research, and of course, most importantly, all of the coronavirus researchers who generated this body of data uh, that is really critical for us in thinking about how to move forward with the pandemic, and very importantly, all of the scientists and medical personnel and volunteers who are working really tirelessly uh, to fight the pandemic. We, we are deeply indebted to them. And then as my last slide, I'm just going to kind of list up here. I'm not going to read through these, but you can look at them as, as you want. What I think are some key open basic science questions that are going to be important to address uh, and to resolve as we learn more about um, these viruses uh, that will be uh, important going forward for interpreting um, COVID-2 uh, and potentially future zoonotic transfers of additional coronaviruses. So with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Hey, Brett, this is uh, Brett, this is Lauren. Um, first, that was fantastic. And second, let me assure you that there are many questions. Oh, great. So, <laughs> um, I, I've been busy collating them and uh, I'm going to start pitching them to you now. Um, one of the questions is on the role of the viroporins in the life cycle. Um, th there's a specific question here. So you, you, you talked about how the um, inner membranes are getting remodeled. Um, and uh, the questioner points out that in poliovirus, ORF2B is a viroporin where the currents are thought to help contribute to that. So given that COVID-2 has three putative viroporins, do, do you think that they could be playing a role in that as well? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. The short answer is I don't know, but I think that's a completely reasonable hypothesis. Uh, yeah, the, the, the question asker is, is correct that poliovirus, like many RNA viruses, is doing its, its replication in association with membranes and is remodeling membranes too. And so whether those types of viroporins are going to play analogous roles for COVID-2, um, I think is going to be a fascinating question. And I don't know the answer, and I, I think it's not known. So so, yeah. That, 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 that's my impression as, as well. Um, another excellent question you've got here. So this has, um, this question has two parts. The first part of the question is, is it known um, that viral fusion is acid dependent for SARS-1 and SARS-2 as it is for many viruses? Yeah, another great question. Um, and this kind of gets to the issue of, is fusion occurring at the plasma membrane or is it occurring in the endosome? Because if it's occurring in the endosome, the assumption is that there's probably an acid dependent um, fusion event that's happening there. And the results are kind of mixed where there are data suggesting that fusion can occur at the plasma membrane and data suggesting that fusion can occur within endosomes. And so whether that's because both can occur or because systems are different when these things were measured um, is a little bit unclear. But I think it's going to be a very important thing to clarify because, as you're aware, drugs that block endosome acidification could, of course, be things that would be um, uh, viable targets if acidification is required for COVID-2 entry. Yeah, so you have intuited the second half of the question, which is about um, the world's most popular drug at this moment. Chloroquine. <laughs> yes, yes, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, you know, so could, they are weak bases that accumulate in uh, organelles such as the endosome. So, so could their deacidification be a plausible role that way they're helping here? Yep, that's, I would say, the leading hypothesis for if those drugs end up helping, um, it would possibly, I think the most likely hypothesis is that because they're, uh, they're blocking an acidification process that might be needed for entry. Um, it's possible that they're having additional effects on membrane biogenesis or, or organelle sort of reorganization that is required that are not as clearly articulated. So I think the simplest hypothesis is that one of acidification blocking acidification. Yeah, I mean, I've seen up to, you know, 10 plausible hypotheses <laughs> of mechanism of action. Um, 
but I'll leave that for another time. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a here's a, a very uh, a, a fairly general question. Um, given that uh, COVID two shares so much in common with SARS one. Um, you know, d what sort of advantages do we actually have and what do we, what advantages do we think we should have but don't actually have to build upon that knowledge base for rapid development of drugs, vaccines, etc.? Yeah, um, that's an important question and there's maybe two ways to answer it. One is that, yes, because of SARS, we have a much, much larger knowledge base than we would have. So coronaviruses were that there was an explosion of coronavirus research in response to the 2003 SARS outbreak. And so, in fact, probably the significant majority of information that I presented to you today um, has been uh, a, a acquired since that SARS outbreak. And so that has really led to uh, a dramatic increase in our sort of fundamental in, uh, understanding of how these work, which is going to be relevant for sure for COVID-2 as well. Uh, the second way of thinking about this is, um, you know, maybe a less delightful, <laughs> that's not delightful anyways, but, but the fact that um, there were a large number of initial attempts made um, or to generate vaccines and antivirals against SARS, but those were stopped when the epidemic ended. And so it was sort of seen that that was probably, you know, not going to be a, an investment that many companies were willing to make because that epidemic was ended. And, and had those programs not undergone that go, no go decision at that point in time, we would probably be much farther than we are now in having um, lead candidates in hand and things like that. So, I mean, that, that is what it is. Those are decisions that get made all of the time. Um, but uh, because that epidemic ended quickly, that meant that we don't have as many resources at hand for um, uh, vaccines and antivirals as we would have otherwise. I, um, so I, I'm going to add my own little bit to the question, which which I worry is is even more pessimistic. Um, from what I've been reading about um, vaccines based on targeting spike protein, they you know the early efforts, in addition to being you know defunded, it my reading of the situation is that they actually encountered a great deal of difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you must have seen that the IgG1 um, antibodies against spike protein do seem to induce the class switching of white blood cells to a much more pro-inflammatory state. And they seem to be doing, you know, a great deal of the traumatic lung injury um, that, that is concomitant with this. Yeah, great point. So, yeah, my, my, my personal view, view is we might need to, you know, vaccinate against something other than spike, but mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yep. Okay, here's another good question. Um, you you um, answered a lot of this as your talk went on. Um, you talked about some beautiful mechanisms that the virus uses to control uh, stoichiometry of the various proteins and, um, and also the, the time course of when they come on, you know, so maybe the, you know, the, va the packaging proteins seem to come on uh, later. Uh, so, it, how much is known about the the time course of expression of the the various proteins? Yeah, um, 
I would say that's probably pretty well known. I'm not going to be able to give you an answer off the top of my head as to exactly what that timing is, but it is certainly true that you are going to see uh, a kinetic regulation there, at least in that um, the, the replicase proteins will be expressed first, of course, and the structural proteins are going to be expressed later. Many RNA viruses will actually go through cycles of regulation, of having um, kind of waves of this, this um, non-structural protein and nucleoprotein come up. And then as the RNA gets replicated and may deplete levels of nucleoprotein in particular, that causes them to shift to different types of replication. And so it may not just be sort of a linear line of this comes on and that comes on throughout the course of infection. It could be that there are waves of kinetics happening there as, as well. And I'm, I'm assuming that's known for coronaviruses, and I just don't personally know the answer. Yep. Fascinating. Um, okay. Here, um, here is a question that's, um, you know, of course, on everybody's mind. Um, what, do, can you talk briefly about the rates of mutation of COVID-2 versus, um, CoV-1 um, and, you know, the implications of that for antibody escape, um, you know, vaccine, yeah. um, etc. Yeah. Yep. Um, right. Rates of mutation are hugely important for thinking about any RNA virus, but this is a, you know, kind of an outlier, as I mentioned, because of the proofreading activity, we are probably not going to see the same rates of mutation as you do for other RNA viruses. And I think that's holding true for some of the um, sequencing analysis, which we're going to have an enormous amount of very soon as much of the testing comes online, and, and that can be used for research to understand just that question. So um, if I'm remembering correctly, the mutation rates are around 10 to the minus 6, I think, for uh, uh, probably for SARS coronavirus. I doubt that is known for coronavirus 2 yet, which is at least an order of magnitude in some cases, two orders of magnitude um, lower than mutation rates for uh, things like picornaviruses. And certainly HIV has an astronomical uh, mutation rate because of uh, reverse transcriptase. Um, so that I think is really going to influence how we think about mutation potentially in a good way, right? I mean, the more highly mutagenic a virus is, the harder it is to come up with things that are going to not have escape mutants that, that come up. And so if the, if in fact the spike protein itself is not undergoing as rapid mutation as it would be in analogous viruses like in influenza or other things, um, then we may have a better chance of being able to generate a uh, longer lasting, um, you know, vaccines or antivirals against, against this virus. And so I think that is a question I hear discussed a lot and a topic that's discussed a lot that I think this massive amount of sequence information that's going to come online shortly, uh, if, you know, building on what's already there, um, is going to be a, a key thing for people to, bioinformaticians to, to deconstruct here. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um... Uh, oh, it, here's a question that I had. So, um, re reading up on the SARS-1 literature, I see that they managed to figure out a, you know, we all know that ACE2 is the primary receptor for, for uh, SARS-1 and SARS-2, but they managed to track down a number of co-receptors for SARS-1 most notably um, DC sign and a C-type lectin and DPP4. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, so I, obviously we don't know these yet for SARS-2. Um, so can you maybe speak to uh, how important, you know, how urgent is it that we figure out what these co-receptors are um, in, in terms of, you know, potential interventions? Yeah, uh, it is obviously an important question and important in maybe different ways. And depending on, are these co-receptors things that um, uh, 
facilitate entry after engagement with ACE2 or things that use, are used as alternate receptor in the event that ACE2 interaction is blocked. And if we're generating neutralizing antibodies against ideally the receptor binding domain of spike, as probably most vaccines are trying to do, um, to what extent are those going to be sort of cross protective against all potential receptors if there are other receptors that can get used. And so in that context, I, I do think it's an important question. Some of the, some of the um, you know, lectins and things like that tend not to be, those are often things that viruses use to, as attachment receptors rather than entry receptors. Mm -hmm. And so while that is, of course, important information as well, not as critical as understanding what are the receptors that will lead to actually the, the fusion um, uh, event in the proteolytic cleavages. Excellent. Um, next up, we've got... Um, can you can you talk a bit about bats and what why they why they have so many viruses and is there anything I mean I've seen unfortunately proposals to just kill all bats. Oh yeah. But no. <laughs> it, is there anything is there anything you know maybe more creative that we could do? Hmm. Yeah. What is special about bats that? That is a fascinating question. And one simple answer that I'm going to give you a, a more interesting answer in a second, but one simple answer is that, you know, a bat is not a bat, right? Bats are among the most diverse mammalian species there are. And so there's a huge spectrum of bats out there. So, you know, one question is, is it, well, are bats really special if it's just because there's so many of them um, that there would be the natural, you know, potential host for transmission? And in fact, it's probably not just because there are so many of them. There probably are things that are special about bats. And it's known that they seem to be able to harbor viruses that are super virulent in humans, you know, things like Nipah virus and Ebola virus and these coronaviruses, when there are spillover events from bats, they're real killers in the human population. And so how is it that bats can serve as a reservoir host for these? The definition of a reservoir host is usually something that can harbor a virus without itself getting a disease from that virus. So why can they harbor these hyperpathogenic viruses in hu that humans, they're hyperpathogenic for us, but not for the bats. And so there's some really interesting work that has come out of uh, Kara Brooks and, and Mike Boots, who are um, both uh, evolutionary modelers, and, and Kara works in Madagascar studying bats and bat immune systems, actually. And their work and others has suggested that bats have a different type of immune system that we have. Um, and in fact, one of the features is that they seem to have a constitutive interferon response, mm. which may allow them to tolerate, um, or the viruses at least that can exist in bats have evolved to have a higher uh, replication rate um, because they are controlled in the bat population. And so they have, have evolved to have this more robust um, uh, replication rate such that when they transfer into humans, then they just replicate like crazy because our mm -hmm. interferon response is induced and not constitutive. Um, there's some other data suggesting that they may be able to counteract um, uh, inflammasome activity and, and things like that. So I think that there are going to be some really interesting immune-based answers to why bats harbor viruses that are hyperpathogenic for humans. Yeah, I, I, I my faulty memory is going to show itself here, but I remember reading something about um, how since they fly and, ha and have like enormous metabolic needs, that somehow that was intimately associated with their immune response. Yep, that is also tied into this. Their metabolism is... Um, uh, very high for their body size. So there's this, this weird connection where bats are outliers for body size, metabolism, and longevity. Makes them odd for flying animals, which tend to have really high metabolisms, but shorter uh, longevities. And so why is it that bats fall into that unusual category? And does that somehow tie into their ability to tolerate these pathogens because of that metabolism or other, other facets of, of that? I, yeah, I, that is clearly a piece of that explanation, but I think not understood mechanistically how that really happens. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, next up, 
um, so you showed us that um, that CoV2 is is genius in shutting down our interferon response, but how do they? You know, we must have some sort of resting interferon signaling. How do they? How do they evade destruction for long enough to get all their sneaky things in place? Yeah, I my guess there is uh, is through the overlapping mechanisms that they have to counteract the innate immune response at multiple levels. It's not, you know, NSP1 is clearly doing a big job there, but I think I left listed five or six and different proteins, plus there's all these other accessory factors that are coming at immune evasion from different angles. And that is not at all unusual for viruses. Any virus that is successful is successful because it's found a way around uh, inna innate immune restriction, basically. And these just happen to be very good at that. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. I've got one more. Uh, I'll allow myself the liberty of one more question. Fair enough. Um, what, um, what, what is your impression of what's known um, thus, thus far about the role of antibody-dependent enhancement of, of this? You know, I, I had that already as a question, but then, you know, I knew that SARS-1 and SARS-2 antibodies cross-reacted, but of course none of us have been infected with SARS-1. But the fact that a seasonal one uh, co-reacted, co then I was like, oh my, you know, like what, is there the possibility that our antibodies against a seasonal cold that we have are actually doing us wrong in addition to doing us right? I think it is possible. I don't think there is yet evidence suggesting that is happening. Um, yeah, sure, when people think about antibody-dependent enhancement, you know, you're worried it's gonna be something like the dengue virus model <laughs> where one infection causes a worse infection the second go round all the way up until you get to the fourth serotype and then you're at risk for dengue uh, hemorrhagic fever. Um, so that's of course the classic example of an ADE. Um, and I have also, you know, heard this ADE potential model discussed as well. And my impression is, is that, um, that it doesn't have a huge amount of evidence supporting it right now. And so, yeah, it's equally possible or maybe more possible that those other circulating antibodies are either going to do nothing if they're not neutralizing antibodies or could okay. reduce the severity of an infection to some degree if they're partially neutralizing. Mm -hmm. um, so whether or not, if ADE happens, that will be very important to show. I'm not sure the data are there yet to suggest it is. Uh, I was under the impression that ADE was conclusively shown for SARS-1, though. For, from one of the circulating uh, no, uh, coronavirus? Sorry, forget about the seasonal ones. I thought that just, um, that maybe during the duration of a single bout with SARS-1, that I thought that they had, and again, maybe I'm misremembering, I thought that they had conclusively shown that that could lead to, um, for instance, infection of cell types with no ACE2. Ah, so you're meaning ADE, uh, not from a secondary infection, but that there's some ex uh, um, antibody enhancement from that initial infection that is changing the, um, the cell tropism of the virus to potentially expand it, say, into lower lung or something like that. That, yeah, I, I mixed two questions. In okay, um, possible. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know those data, so it, that's possible, okay. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you have answered a great deal of our questions. Um, I want to thank you again from all of Janelia. You've got almost 300 attendees. Great. Um, it, so <laughs> good luck. And, thank you uh, for having me. <laughs> again. All right. See you, Lauren. All right. Take care. Mm -hmm.